Welcome to another episode of Coach's Corner. It is just myself and Paul today, and uh, we're going to embark on a uh, very dense and misunderstood topic, I guess to say. Maybe not misunderstood, more so than uh, just a lot of misconceptions out there um, about people trying to profit off of the nutrition and nutrition advice to, to give people. So we're going to go dive into nutrition for the next four to six weeks. And we're going to have on some guests that we find that put out good information and are very credible within the the field of nutrition and nutrition science. Um, We are not registered dietitians by any means. So this is just more of a anecdotal entertainment only type of advice we're giving out. Um, But Paul, how are things going? How's your prep going and, and life in general? Things are going great, man. Prep is uh, ramping up nice and slowly. Um, and I say that because that was that's the intent, but like I'm just taking what's there and what's there has been a lot more than what I thought would be. Um, squats already in the sevens. Uh, pulls, pulls are in the sixes. Benches, I hit like a 440 uh, slingshot bench, which for me is like, I'm really bad at that movement, so. It's a good indicator for me. And I mean, I still have 13 weeks, so I'll take another probably heavy attempt and then kind of work back down and clean them up. And yeah, I'm really happy with that. Uh, body weight staying around like 230, 233. So well within range of 220. And then uh, body actually feels good. Like I'm not in pain day to day, which is nice. So the the idea I had to spread my volume out a little bit more evenly throughout the week uh, and add in a fifth day to to even lower the daily volume even more uh, has worked out really, really well. So I'm actually going to, I have a bunch of travel the next little bit. So I'm going to deload preemptively, even though I feel good, um, just to make sure that I don't, I don't push things too too much. And uh, yeah, I really, really can't complain. How are you doing? How's your training going? It's going good. It's uh, like four weeks out from PANS and um, it's going well, doing a lot of uh, competition style rolling, um, which is nice. It's it's good and it's bad. It's good in the fact that like you just show up the class and you live roll and and you're pushing the pace pretty good. And, you know, you're either going we we do eight minutes um, and in competition it starts off at five for masters for us older folks. Um, but the nice thing about the competition classes is we do a lot of stand up takedown and that gasses you very, very fast, which I found out, especially when you're going against the ultra heavies because they just push each other around because no one wants to be on the bottom. So it's like a shoving match until someone trips or someone takes the other person down. Thank God. Um, so practicing those things is, is going to be very, very helpful, but it's um, the more you do those classes, the less you learn technique wise. So I'm doing okay. like two to three days a week of technique classes, and then we do some live roles and then two days a week of <clears throat> competition live roles. Um, and we have a couple guys at our gym who are um, ultra heavies, 250 black belt and like a 280 brown belt. So I get to go against them and, you know, if I can like wiggle out just a little bit against them, then I feel like I can do good against blue belts. So we'll we'll see. Um, So training for that's going good. Uh, Training for the century ride is, I feel pretty good about it. Like I did 50 miles not too long ago on the bike and this was a hybrid bike. So it wasn't the fastest and I just got a, um, an endurance bike now. And I'm keeping right around like 19 to 21 miles per hour oh, at nice. about 130 to 140 beats per minute heart rate. So I feel pretty good. Um, I just got to get the fueling down, right? And mm-hmm. that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. But last time we did 50 at like mile 40, my legs, just my quads just felt like, you know, like you do a, a bunch of leg extensions, but then yeah. you like drop set it, but you keep your legs in the machine the entire time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's how it felt the last 10 miles. <laughs> and there's nothing that I could do to like, I stood up, I couldn't do anything. 
to get rid of that pain. It stuck around for like an hour after the ride. And that just tells me that the fueling wasn't the, the greatest. So I got to play around with some of the fueling because um, I'll do a lot of my training fasted uh, mm. when, when it's like aerobic training. Right. Um, and if I'm doing sprints, I'll have carbohydrates and stuff like that. So I'm trying to make sure that I'm as fat adaptive in the beginning of my ride as possible. And then towards the end of my ride, rely more on carbohydrates as opposed to relying on carbohydrates in the beginning and then getting rid of that glycogen in the very beginning, which has been shown throughout the research to um, increase your rate of fatigue, increase uh, perceived exertion. So if I can manipulate my diet and nutrition to where I'm more fat adaptive, so I've been checking my blood glucose first thing in the morning and I'm waking up. Um, around like 67 to 70, which is really good. I'm yeah. very, very happy about that. And if I can maintain that going into a ride, then I know that I'm using mostly fat um, as my main energy source in the very beginning. And then maybe like 25 to 40 miles in, start bringing in the carbohydrates um, through gels and through like pursue and, and things like that. Um, so I'm going to play around that. The next long ride is not going to be until after the tournament. I'll do a 60 to 70 mile ride and then that'll be it until November. So right now I'm just trying to get as many 20 to 30 mile rides in as possible um, just to get acclimated, just to build up that aerobic engine as much as I can. And then one sprint ish workout a, a week where I just go high gears, uh, one minute on and then like five minutes off. And then I'll just push that for, uh, for like 30 to 40 minutes. So if your worry is fueling, are you able to practice that, um, that protocol with these shorter, shorter rides or no, no, it's going to have to be with that one long ride. It's like one in one attempt and you're done. Yeah. 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 For sure. Like, um, I've been practicing it with some brick, like I'm, I'm doing brick workouts as well. Okay. So I'll go for like a 20 mile ride and then like a 30 minute jog afterwards. So mm -hmm. I've been playing with it there to see. Um, so, and then the other fuel and stuff that I've been playing with is like more high fat meals before going out, mm -hmm. uh, using like MCT oils and, and things like that to have more of that faster digesting fat versus um more carbohydrate meals so i'm just kind of playing around seeing which one's working better interesting yeah that's cool i mean it's you, you think of the ways that we used to manipulate our nutrition for powerlifting and, and you know or hypertrophy it's similar but yeah completely different yeah yeah diff different energy systems right and you know you're training i mean there's some days i'm training three four days four times a day so it's like trying to get all that in. Don't you have seven jobs? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How yeah. the fuck do you train four times a day? Very tightly. Very, very tightly. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Um, but well, everything's going good with that. Cool. Yeah. I'm excited. I think it's great. That. I think it's I would, great that you've got like you've continued to find ways to continue to challenge yourself to create that discomfort. Oh, this is just the beginning, man. I have some stupid stuff planned for the future. If I can just get my body weight down, I'd be very happy. Do we want to get into that conversation? <laughs> we, we <laughs> every every food post on Instagram is baked goods. Oh, that's so, that's like such not the norm, <laughs> but it is what it is. Um, you have a sweet tooth. It's okay. It was what? You have a sweet tooth. It's okay. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like, why wouldn't you? It's delicious. It's true. It is. But, yeah, so I started tracking my food. Because um, I eat the same thing every day. And it was right around, like, 3,200, 3,300 calories. So, okay. right now, getting ready for the jiu-jitsu tournament, understanding that there's no weight class. I'm trying to get it up to like 4,500 just to get better performance wise. And then from there, um, after the jujitsu tournament, try to drop some weight. Like, I think 
if I can get down to 210, I think I can do some of this endurance stuff that I want to do without, like, I can do it now. I've done it before. I've done a half marathon um, and I've done long, long duration, 24 hour endurance stuff. Um, but the last time I did that, I got like stress fractures in my feet and I was fucked up for a week or two. So I know that's not only is oh. that gate gate cycling and, and body weight, but it's also, but it's mostly body weight. So I got to get that down in order for me to be a little bit better. That sounds like a pretty good incentive. Yeah. 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 But the, the issue is, is that ever since, let's see, I hired, I worked with Austin a couple years ago to do a bodybuilding show. Yep. And ever since, like, it used to be like, I, I would make calorie adjustments and I would start losing weight easy ever since that. And it wasn't anything that he did. It was just, as soon as I started working with them, my body was just like, not the same. And nowadays it's like, I'll reduce down. I'll go to 2,500 calories and I'll gain a couple pounds and then I'll go to 4,000 calories and I'll drop up. So it's like, there's no consistency in how my body's reacting to the food. So I'm not really as concerned with that as just focusing on performance and hopefully the engine will start to drive the, the weight loss. Right. So, but that's just kind of some of the things you got to play around with as a, as a nutritionist, I'm going to get some blood work done and, and see what's going on. See if everything's healthy, mm -hmm. obviously 12 years of competing at a high level and using drugs can always mess things up. And the older you get, the harder it gets as well. So you know, I might have done some damage to my thyroid. I might have done some damage to other things that I got to get in line. So yeah, I'm what looking, it is. my thyroid's pretty not awesome. So I, I know that I'm definitely going to have to be dealing with that very soon. Yeah. Uh, yeah I already I talked to Meredith about it, who we're going to have on the podcast. And that's, I'm really looking forward to that conversation. This, yeah. This nutrition topic is people... So nutrition is one of those things where on the surface, it's very simple, right? Like the food we eat gets converted to energy, the amount of food that we eat and the proportions of the, the compounds within those make up our diet and how we respond to our training and so on. But then when you dive into it and say, okay, well, it's really easy to make it complicated. And what's shitty is when, it, when it's complicated, it sounds cooler. And when it sounds yeah. cooler, people can make money. And what we've essentially done is we've, we, I mean, the fitness industry has created this, uh, you know, magical nutrition world where thermodynamics make no sense and everything costs money. What I, what I'm hoping over the next four to six weeks is you and I can come together and kind of just clarify to people. Nutrition is quite simple. And it can be extremely powerful when used correctly. So, you know, diving into nutrition and you look at what we're eating, there's a few, I would say, like baseline guidelines that I provide to people when they come to work with me uh, on their nutrition is that we're going to prioritize nutrient, like we're going to prioritize whole foods, single ingredient whole foods. We're going to prioritize eating on a regular basis. So we're not going extended periods of fasting and we're gonna prioritize protein. And if we can do those three things, we're off to a good start. Then in my opinion, you could probably add, you know, hydrating optimally. So at, at least four to, four to six liters of, of water a day and then fruits and or vegetables with each meal. If you could go with that, I think you'd be hard pressed to find someone who would perform poorly and gain a bunch of unwanted body weight if they were following those five guidelines. Yeah, no, definitely. And one of the things that we want to focus on right now is like the idea that food is, is energy because that that's common knowledge to a lot of people, but getting into these um, other hobbies and other sports and actually working with athletes not many of them know this, right? Like within the fitness industry, it's well known, but you work with professional athletes, college athletes, um, even working with some of these guys in jujitsu, 
they're like, I need to make weight for this tournament. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to eat um, some little bit of chicken with some avocado because carbs are bad for you. And, and, you know, they're like, I'm going to go down to like 1500 calories and I'm just going to drop a bunch of weight. Or he's like, that's how you do it. Right. I'm like, no, not, not at all. You're, you're a performance athlete first. So you have to understand that the food that you eat gets converted to energy and that energy is how you perform at a high level. And depending on what energy systems you use, you have the phosphocreatine system, you have the glycolytic system, and you have the aerobic or oxidative system, right? They're going to be preferentially geared towards one fuel source or the other, right? So if you are a more anaerobic-based athlete, you're going to have to rely a lot on the phosphocreatine stores and and that system, right? And you're also going to rely on the glycolytic system, which its preferred source of energy is going to be through carbohydrates. So then if you're going into more of the aerobic stuff, right, you can have some of that longer duration fat metabolism as an energy source, right? So we want to understand that the food that we eat provides us with the energy to train. And if we're able to train hard, that's going to give us the best body composition, the best like everything you want is based on how well you can perform. You, you never hear of somebody saying, man, I ate like shit, but I performed really great the next day. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you can gear yourself towards fueling your performance and making sure that you're performing at a high level and understanding that the food you eat is energy to push that performance, then that's going to guide you more to your nutrition choices best than, and then anything else that I can think of. Right. I totally agree. Um, One thing that I always try to hit home to people is that regardless of what type of nutritional intervention that you undertake, the training session and the training stimulus need to be the most important thing. You can't sacrifice your performance. Is there instances where you need to? Yeah, if you're trying to drop a ton of body weight, you're probably not gonna be as strong. But that's like, that's poor planning. It's poor planning, poor time, mm-hmm. I would say. Yeah. Right. If you if you if you take the appropriate amount of time, you can you can do a good job of it. Um, but I also think that people have placeboed themselves into thinking that that's a guarantee. Yeah. Like I had a client tell me, like, oh, you know, I'm really feeling my leverages are changing and I, I'm starting to lose some strength. The guy lost four pounds. Right. And I was like, Bro, my girlfriend just squatted 285 for a three by three, four weeks out from a wellness show on 900 calories. I think you're fine. Right. Yeah. That, <laughs> and that's, that, that mental aspect is, is huge, right? Going into the gym, feeling sluggish, feeling deprived is something that you're telling yourself on a daily basis. And then that's going to project itself into to how you perform, right? So I think if we understand the dynamics of nutrition, right? Like, First things first, if we're trying to lose weight or perform at a high level, we need to protect the muscle that we have because the muscle that we have is what drives our ability to perform, to produce force, to to do all that stuff, right? So protein is the thing that's going to drive us to keep as much muscle on as possible or to add muscle as we're training. And the recommended range for protein for athletes within the literature is 1.8 to 2.2 kilograms per gram of body weight or one grams per pound. Grams per kilogram, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that's what's, that's the range you wanna be at, right? And I think um, you did a protein overfeeding lecture, so you can kind of go into to that end of things, but staying on the dynamics of, of protein, right? As you train, and as you train hard, your body starts to break down the muscle to um, because you're you're training. So every time you train, you start to micro tears in your muscle tissue and and then it repairs itself and then it comes back together stronger and bigger. And that's kind of the basic idea. Right. And if you don't provide the protein that you need to do this, what happens is and that's why it's the essential amino acids are, are so important here what happens is if you don't have that protein your body starts to break down its own muscle to create all the amino acids that you need in order for you to start regenerating and, and rebuilding 
So we want to focus on making sure that we're fueling our body with protein and, and the right amount of protein and whole protein sources instead of incomplete protein sources. And that's like the first thing you want to do when you're thinking about calculating calories for your meal plan is like, all right, I'm going to be at one gram per pound. We'll just keep it easy with that one gram per pound. Right. And that's that 2.2. And for me, I'm 230, between 230 and 235. So that's where my protein is going to be at. Multiply that by four. That's right around 800 to 900 calories, give or take. Right. That's going to be my first calorie rate where I'm at. And then I'll start to add the other stuff, but kind of go into some of the, your thoughts on the protein and the protein overfeeding. And because to me, that's like, that's the best, that's the macronutrient we want to focus on the most. It's the most satiating. It's yep. the most, has the most thermic effect on your body. So give a little bit more yeah. rundown on the protein side of things. So the other really important point to remember when we're talking about protein intake and nutrition is if we're training and we're breaking down muscle tissue and we're, our body has to rely on its own stores of amino acids to replenish itself, you are going to have a net decrease in muscle protein, which means your lean body mass will go down, which means your metabolic rate will drop, which is why we want to protect our muscle mass as much as possible, because it means as we lose body fat, we can continue to eat a little bit more food than we would if our, if, if our metabolic rate hadn't dropped. Now, protein overfeeding was a really interesting thing to dive into because it's always been in like the bro science is like protein, protein, protein. We eat every meal has 10 ounces of protein per meal or whatever it might be. And I think they were ahead of their time because the paper that I reviewed was essentially two isocaloric diets, but then one group ate about 800 calories more from just protein. And the only difference between the two groups was the group that ate more protein had more muscle at the end of the study. Now, can we make inferences from just one study? Probably not. But what we can say is that if you are gonna overeat on something, it might as well be protein because the chances of it being converted to body fat are likely gonna be lower. The other thing that I, I've looked into is like, okay, well, if I think this is cool and meaningful, I gotta test it out. So with myself, I've added a hundred grams of protein to my day. I'm eating almost about like 375 grams of protein over the last four weeks. I've gained zero pounds. Then my meat, or my, my meat, my steps, always the same. Sleep's very consistent. Uh, very few cheat. I think I've had one cheat meal, but the, then with all my clients, I've also been trying the same, not all my clients, a few, mostly women. Um, and the results have been incredible. 160 pound woman eating 200 grams of protein, dropping body fat, performance stays the same. Like it's been quite drastic. So this is just kind of my caveat to that is it might be something you want to play with. It might not be for you. One thing I am noticing is that on some days, digestion is an issue. If I try to get all of that from whole food. Okay. Um, oh, the other piece with that, you mentioned it, protein is the most satiating macronutrient. So when you're trying to lose body fat um, and you're trying to create a caloric deficit, if you're able to keep your protein higher, likely you're going to be more satiated. You're less likely to deviate from the plan. On the flip side, if you're trying to gain weight and you're trying to drive your protein up, it could be so satiating that you're unable to eat the requisite amount of calories to maintain a caloric surplus, which is something I did run into with one of my clients. He, he was just, there's too much protein. He was trying to eat 6,000 calories a day and the, the protein was way too high. Funny thing is we dropped his protein back to 1.2. He was at 1.5. We dropped down to 1.2. So the calories went down, his body weight went up. Yeah. And I was like, Okay, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's cool to see that stuff, man, and it's 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 always something that you have to keep in mind as an athlete, right? Is that it's very hard to add muscle and if our muscle is continuously um damaged, so to speak, they're under under recovered, uh, our ability to perform, which has been shown in the research, goes down. Our our risk of injury goes up. 
those are the things that we always want to play around. So if, if protein's not your thing um, and you have a hard time eating it, you still want to make sure you're at that 1.6 um, grams per kilogram, right? Which is about 0.8 grams per pound. So you want to make sure that that's your bare minimum. And then from there, you can work and play around with it. If you do have issues digesting protein, there are ways to, to help with that. Um, there is digestive enzymes like uh, pepsin and betaine HCL. Those are great protein digesting enzymes that can help you digest protein a little bit better. But you want to make sure that that's the most important macronutrient that you dial in first, right? And then after that, you want to think about fat consumption, not because fat drives performance, but you have to understand that fat is very good at our ability to create hormones within our body and our ability to maintain those hormones. And research has shown time and time again through case studies and through um, even randomized control trials that once you start to be in a calorie deficit, your hormones start to tank as well. And the closer you get, the leaner you get, the longer you've been dieting, the more and more those hormones start to go in the tank. And um, from a performance standpoint, right, there's not many performance benefits of fat mm -hmm. in your diet, but if you're below a certain threshold, there has been shown performance decrements, right? And that threshold is about 20% of your total calories. Um, the recommended range for fats is going to be anywhere between 20 and 35%. As long as you're within that ballpark, um, more than 30% hasn't been shown to improve performance, but less than 20 has been shown to be a decrement. So if you can stay within that 20 to 30, then that's going to be that sweet spot. If you like fats, go up to that 30%. If you don't drop it down to that 20, but just know if you do start to cut calories and you can't touch fats, once you're at that 20%, unless you're on PEDs, don't mess with your fats. They need to be there. Um, like I said, they're, they're our main driver of, of our hormones within our body. And they also help regulate our lipid panels as well. So you want to make sure that you're choosing the correct amount of fats or the correct uh, type of fats, which are going to be your omega-3s, really focusing on the EPA, DHA. Um, research shows that about 1,000 milligrams a day of EPA has been shown to help fix depression, anxiety, um, and, and a lot of other kind of mental and uh, psychological issues that a lot of people have. And, you know, it's been shown to improve your uh, testosterone and just a whole bunch of other things, your joints, uh, cognitive health, all that stuff is very, very important. So that's kind of the idea with, with fats is like a baseline. Once you get that baseline down, um, if you're in at 30%, you can have some wiggle room to pull while you're dieting down to 20, but you never want to get below 20. Uh, Paul, anything to add with the fats? No, I, I, I'm fats are definitely the second thing that I look at. And you, when we say, when we say 20%, it's 20% of total calories a day. So if we're looking at the diet and the daily, and the one thing to remember is as your calories drop, 20% of those calories changes. But have you ever found that there's like non-negotiable levels where you just won't bring people down past that? Oh yeah, definitely. And it's, yeah. it's typically that, that 20%, even if their calories don't mean change. like total grams, total grams. Um, I mean, if they're, yeah, if they're, if say like it's a high carb day, mm -hmm. right. I'll try to keep their fats as low as possible. Knowing right. that if you look at the spectrum of a week, their fats are within yes. range, okay. right? So that's kind of the thing, right? If you take a day or two to lower the fats and increase the carbohydrates to get that person feeling better, if they've been in a deficit for a while, then make sure that the other days have the fats to kind of make up for that. Do Have I ever kept them in an extended period of time? I'm sure I have. Um, is it an ideal situation? No, but if the idea is we want to get to a certain body fat percent to either step on stage or perform or get to a certain weight class, mm -hmm. you have to, sometimes have it's to not going to be right. Exactly. And I'm not going to really touch protein. I'm not going to really touch carbohydrates so much to where their performance goes down. Right. But also understand too, that I work mostly with performance enhanced athletes. 
So right. by decreasing their fats, I'm not as concerned about their hormone levels because they're taking exogenous hormones. So I, I, I think about those things. If it's a natural person, I'm very much more cautious with their fats. Same. Yeah. But yeah. So what I was getting at there is like, even though that 20% might drop, there needs to be an adequate amount of, of fat in the diet for satiety, one thing, and two, uh, for insulin sensitivity. So if you keep, if you keep your fats too low for too long, even as an enhanced athlete, you will run, I shouldn't say you will, you are more liable to run into insulin resistance issues. Um, and then the same problem exists with, uh, the weight gain athlete. If the fats are too high, fats are quite satiating because they slow gas, gastric emptying. So if your fats are too high, it might inhibit your ability from eating enough total calories to gain weight. So that's where that, that play in comes from understanding that you need a requisite amount of total calories. You need a requisite amount of protein and a requisite amount of fats, fats to maintain hormonal function, uh, your lipid profile and insulin sensitivity. But as you were kind of alluded to a number of times, carbohydrates is where you're going to drive most of your calories from. Yeah. Before we get into carbs, do you, even on a calorie deficit, you have found that if it is a high carbohydrate diet and they're losing weight, that they have insulin issues. Um, I've had a couple. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I wonder what else those, going those on. people were enhanced athletes. So you're already in a hyperinsulinemic environment. Um, but were they usually, sleeping good with high stress at all or anything like that? They were dieting, so their sleep was probably pretty shitty. I yeah. don't remember off the top of my head, but I, I know what you're getting at because um, if you were in a caloric deficit, you're likely going to be more insulin sensitive. Right. right the, the bat, yeah. The research shows like it doesn't really matter what the diet is. If you're losing weight, you're improving your insulin sensitivity. Now, mm -hmm. I've had people, right, the idea of like, in your off season um, for like bodybuilders or people who are trying to put on muscle, you're trying to get calories as high as possible so that you can start pulling them. So you have a higher ceiling to pull from whether or not there's any truth to that. I don't know. You talk to guys like Austin and he's so metabolically adaptive that he can get up to 6,500 calories and he'd like, Oh, I'm in a good place. But then he never starts losing weight until he's like at, 30 so he's at like 3000 calories no matter what right so he always has to get so down frustrating right he always has to get down to like very low calories to get lean it's never been a, an improvement of that um but the research does look at those those type of things in terms of like as long as you're losing weight you're able to improve insulin sensitivity but i have had people who have gone into this big surplus and then we start dieting but they're insulin resistant. They're like almost pre-diabetic because they have so many calories. So we maybe spend two weeks of a higher fat, lower carbohydrate diet to bring those numbers down. And then once we get that down, then we can start their diet and process. Um, so that's something to, to think of as well. Like as long as you're losing weight, your insulin sensitivity will be better. Right. But I think having a low carbohydrate, higher fat diet will improve those markers a little bit faster. Um, so Agreed. something to, to think about, but yeah. So then, then you already have your protein, right? And then you just figured out your fat calories. Now everything else is gonna come from carbohydrates, right? Because carbohydrates are our preferred energy fuel source. They're the most readily available to use whenever we're doing anything. Our brain um, prefers glucose as well. Um, our brain actually for, per capita uses the most amount of calories and, and glucose in a day. Um, I think it uses like 25% of the glucose and carbohydrates we take in something like that. I don't remember off the top of my head, but that it's, it's a pretty significant number. It's pretty factual. I think during COVID there's a percent that number definitely went down for most people. Yeah. <laughs> one of the, one of the cool pieces of research um, is they, they did research on chess players and chess players, I think, by playing the game chess at a high level, burn anywhere from like 600 to 800 calories. I, I read that study. It's, it's crazy. Right? It's amazing. Right? So, you know, the idea of working up, like uh, Ben Stiller said, I work Making up a mental, mental sweat. sweat. 
<laughs> so it's, 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 it's true. It's, it's very true. But yeah, carbohydrates, they're our biggest fueler of performance at a high level. So when we are trying to diet and we are trying to preserve performance as much as possible, we want to make sure that we think about carbohydrates driving our engine um, to keep us performing at a high level. Because if we start to deteriorate our performance, not only does that maybe preclude to the idea that we're losing muscle while we're in a deficit, but it also will show you that you're not one able to work as hard, which means you're probably not burning as many calories throughout the day because you're probably going to be a little bit more lethargic, a little bit more sedentary, because if you can't push yourself through training, typically the rest of your day is going to be even slower. And that's something that we see with the idea of metabolic adaptation is, you know, it's not so much that our body's metabolically adapting in terms of, of the, the name per se, but it is that we just start to slow down. Everything slows down. We don't burn as many calories throughout the day. And a lot of that can be driven through carbohydrates. That's why when we do refeeds, when you do see the diet break studies, a lot of them manipulate carbohydrates over, over anything. And I don't think I've ever seen with success or heard with success that people do high fat refeed days and the people feel better because of it, because it doesn't play the same amount of role that it does with the leptin and the ghrelin and, and the metabolism and stuff like that. I remember uh, hearing Bill Campbell speak about that, that like fat loading didn't really have the same effect as carbohydrate loading, which is why they usually manipulate carbs during their refeeds and during the, the diet breaks. Um, the other thing to remember with carbohydrates is people have the, like, because of, again, the overcomplication of nutrition as a whole by the, the fitness industry, people think that, you know, you have to eat a ton of carbohydrates around your training and, you know, nutrient timing is, is everything. Uh, but for the majority of people, unless you're training multiple times a day, like you are, the timing of your carbohydrates make very little difference. Right. Um, your recovery window is 24, 48 hours after exactly, your session. Exactly. And the, con the, the concept that you're going to be depleting your glycogen to some high degree by, especially if you lift your triples and fives, like, you know, you're not going to do that. Um, but as long as you have an adequate amount of calories during the rest of your day, you're going to be recovering. You're going to have the glycogen stores required to, to perform where we get into the carbohydrates as a fuel source for training, uh, conversation, in my opinion, is when those training sessions go beyond that 60 to 90 minute window. And then we could have a decrease in blood glucose because we're mobilizing liver glycogen. So some carbohydrate intake during training, especially if it's a longer training session, could be beneficial. Um, but that amount of carbohydrates, you don't have to be dumping 50 to 100 grams of carbohydrates no. into, a, into a drink. It could be like 10 to 15. Even, I mean, if you look at some of the mouth rinsing research where they just swish their mouth with carbohydrates, spit it out, those people still performed higher than the placebo um, in regards to their ability that, to perform. Yeah. yeah, they've done that two or three times. So it's, and, and like Paul said, right? Like if you're in a calorie surplus or if you're in maintenance, carbohydrates timing doesn't really matter that much. It's not that big of a deal. Get it in whenever you can get it in. If it's evenly spaced out throughout the day, if all your meals are evenly spaced out throughout the day, perfectly fine. You'll be good. By the end of the day, you get it all in, you'll recover. Um, as long as you're not doing some stupid fasting protocol, which we can get into as well. But we're going to get into it because I have a big gripe with it. <laughs> old, man, like, Paul, old, old man, man Paul, screaming at, the cloud, <laughs> screaming at the cloud. But when, uh, you're in a, but when you're in a deficit, that's when the timing of the carbohydrates really matters the most, right? right? Because if you are in a deficit, yes, your workouts, even in a deficit, probably won't deplete your glycogen stores completely, but they're going to start to see a decrement, right? And I think once that decrement starts to begin, then the perceived fatigue starts to kick in and fatigue in general, right? People, the research shows that people who are doing, um, they did psychoergometer, people who started off with less muscle glycogen or less glycogen in general, which I guess is just muscle glycogen, is uh, they performed more poorly 
even if they were replenishing their glycogen throughout the train and then the ones who started off with their glycogen fully replenished, right? So you don't want to necessarily think about it in terms of you're not going to, because yeah, you're, you're training and you're training hard and it's 60 minutes, you're not going to deplete it. But the fact that you're going into each session, maybe just a small percentage less than you were the last one, you will start to feel that. So you want to protect that as much as possible. And then that's what carbohydrates has been shown to do within the research. It's not a huge difference, but it is a difference. If you look at yeah. some of the refeed studies, if you look at some of the diet break studies, they have been able to <clears throat> keep the metabolism anywhere between 70 to 90 calories more for the groups that did the refeeds, for the groups that did the, the diet breaks, which, yeah, it doesn't sound like a lot, but at the end of a 20 week diet, it, it can lot. be pretty, pretty vital, right? So that's the, so you have your protein, you have your fats, everything else is made with carbohydrates, right? If you are an extremely sedentary person and your only time of exertion is when you go to the gym, your fats may be in that 30 to 35% range, right? For your total calories, because carbohydrates are very dependent on activity levels. If you have low activity levels, you don't need as many carbohydrates. So then that's when you'd get into like the person depends on what the person enjoys to eat, right? We have these base guidelines. We've just laid them out for you. Now it's like, okay, well, what, what do you enjoy eating? What are you going to adhere to? What are you going to look forward to? And if the mm -hmm. person's like, you know, I sit all day and I prefer having more avocado and cheese and, and nut butter in my diet. I'm like, cool. You don't need that many carbohydrates. You're doing a very basic powerlifting program. You're probably burning maybe 200 calories for that workout, which is another thing. People think they burn so many calories when they work out because these stupid watches tell them, yeah, yeah, I burned a thousand calories this workout. No, you didn't. <laughs> Yo, I burned 1600 calories deadlifting. Yeah, you're savage, man. You're fucking savage. <laughs> So yeah, I've had so many, I've had a handful of clients, not so many, but they're like, I don't understand why I'm not losing weight. My, my, my watch is telling me I'm burning 2,800 calories a day and we're only eating 2,200. So why isn't my weight going down? It's like, because your, your watch is full of shit. That's why, but people don't want to believe that. So I, I burned. Here we go. Workout. Oh, you ready for this? It was so many calories. Yeah. 1400 calories oh, dead you look it your face looks very depleted i do have the diet lines already you're sucked in no that's called wrinkles you're old i did get called old the other day <laughs> is that why you're doing a lot more shirtless uh videos so you can hang out with the cool kids oh well, yeah short shorts and shirtless uh videos it's you juicy boy summer I don't even know why you came up with that stuff. It's like the people who call lifting spicy. I just don't get it. <laughs> None of it makes sense to me. Which I'm showing my true old man nature myself. That just doesn't, none of that makes sense to me. So, so yeah, you have all the ideas of like, this is how to make a great diet. But the thing that's going to be also equally as important, if not more important, is like, what does the client actually enjoy doing? Yeah. What do they feel best on? right? You can have all the science in the world backing up your claims. But if your client is telling you, Hey man, look, you're giving me a lot of carbohydrates. I feel bloated. I feel lethargic. I'm not getting any work done. Guess what? They don't need that many carbohydrates then, right? Having them adhere to the diet is the most important thing. As long as you don't go below that protein threshold, all that other stuff, play around with it, right? It's not that important, you know, and uh, go ahead. Yeah. So one thing that, that we need to remember is because adherence is the only thing that matters. If the person's not going to adhere to the diet, you might as well just not even be there. Um, so as long as we're adhering to a caloric goal and a protein goal, most of the research has shown that in the majority of times, percentage of fats and, and carbs don't matter. Right? right. So as long as, as long as protein calories are equated, the out goal outcome is not affected by the amount of carbohydrates and fats. The other thing we have to remember is if the person prefers to eat that way, they're going to feel more competent and confident in what they're doing, which increases adherence through self-efficacy. And I did a talk about this during our summit about and my entire talk about adherence was based on self-efficacy because it's the number one predictor of someone's success is 
do they believe they can be successful? Yeah. And what I, what I try to do when I in, intake clients is we go through the, you know, these are how many calories you like we need to eat. This is how much protein you need to eat. Um, you know, we can look at carbohydrates and fats, but then the conversation is, what do you feel most confident with? And in, in a lot of cases, I don't even have clients track their, their carbs, and fa- carbs and fats because they like having flexibility. And if I remove the goal of carbohydrates and fats and all they see is, hey, I hit my protein. Hey, I hit my calories. Guess who feels more confident hitting if you're into the plan? So a big, a big part, and like this is me speaking to coaches now, is you need to look at your client and meet them where they are and set them up with a plan that provides them the biggest opportunity to stack little wins and to build their self-efficacy. Because if over time they see week after week that they've been hitting their calories and hitting their protein, they're seeing the number on the scale go down. They have, they build confidence in the plan. They build their self-efficacy to adhere to it. They believe in what's going on. This feeds into our conversation with John Kiley about how your belief in the system that you're following will impact your results. Like that placebo effect, you're taking advantage of that hundred percent. So the way in which you communicate with the client and teach them along the way of why you're doing it the way you're doing it. Because if, if, if a client comes to you with these, um, you know, these cognitive distortions or, or limiting beliefs around nutrition that say, I can't eat carbs, I have to eat salads at every meal, and blah, 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 this is what I have to do in order to be successful. And then you say, hey, I'd just like for you to track your calories and protein. Yeah. It's going to be a bit of a slap in the face. It's going to be a bit of a, uh, it's going to be a challenge to them. So you need to be able to communicate in a way where you educate them on why you're doing what you're doing. You tell them exactly what you're trying to achieve with it. And then over time, once they see evidence of success, then they can move forward. Whether that means that they're not even tracking calories and just tracking protein, which I've actually done with success yep. with a number of clients, because you know protein is very satiating. So if you're eating a ton of protein, it's really tough to overeat. Yeah, they um, just did that research. Uh, Dr. Campbell just did that research. So hopefully that'll be out in a, in a year or two oh, on untrained untrained females uh, coming in. They came into the gym, I think three to four times a week. One group uh, doubled their protein. One group um, did one, I think it was like one gram per pound. And then another Mm -hmm. group didn't do anything but just eat regularly. So it'll be interesting to see. And all they did was track protein. Incredible. Yeah, I've had a lot of success with that. Um, But I I guess this was just a really long-winded way to say that you know, whatever you do with the athlete from once, once you have the baseline information there, whatever you give the athlete, it needs to be something that they have confidence in their ability to. Yeah. Adhere to. It's creating buy-in, right? Yep. You're meeting them where they're at. You're not like the worst thing you could do as a coach going into a nutrition plan with an athlete is tell them everything they're doing and everything they know is wrong. You know, everything. And this is the plan they're going to do. And if they've never, like, how many times have someone, you've gotten someone and they're like, I don't know what a calorie is. I don't know how to count a calorie. I don't know how to track anything. And you're like, okay, well, this is how we're going to start your diet. Then you just, what do you eat on a daily basis? Just list out all the foods that you normally eat. And we're just going to take out one or two. And then throughout this process of a month of kind of eliminating some of this food, I'm going to teach you how to write down and track your food. Oh, now you spent a month tracking your food. And now you know what macronutrients are, then we can start tracking calories and protein after a month, maybe, right? It's always kind of even, meeting them. Even more so, just sorry to interrupt, but even more so, like if you have them tracking their food in terms of like writing it down or even putting it in an app, just by looking at what they're eating, they're going to eat less shitty stuff. Right. Exactly. So it's it's not overwhelming them. It's not com- convoluting the conversation, right? And that's what happens. As you noticed, throughout this, we didn't take out any macronutrient. We didn't villainize any food. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, the idea is you want to find foods that that sit well with you. You want to find foods that you feel good eating. If, you know, for me, I'll eat some protein with about 30 grams of dark chocolate and some granola before bed. And you tell people that and they're like, oh, granola. 
I didn't know I could eat carbs past 6 p.m. Like you're still dealing with these people as coaches that that information is out there that like carbs after 6 p.m. are going to make you fat or dark chocolate. How can you eat chocolate on a diet? Like that makes no sense. It's like you eat whatever you want as long as you feel good and you're digesting it, you know? Yep. And I think that's one of the biggest issues. And that's when it becomes all this stuff, right? When nutrition, when training, when science becomes a business, that's when you start getting these people who speak in these definitive terms of my approach is best. This is the newest thing that's out there. We're running with this. You have carnivore, you have keto, you have block Atkins, right? Before all that, Mario De Pasquale and his cyclic ketogenic diet, like this stuff's been around forever. People just keep renaming it, right? Yeah. yeah. And you just, we want to make sure that you understand the mechanisms of this is protein. This is what protein does. This is fat. This is what fat does. This is carbohydrates. This is what carbohydrates. Are. Oh, all three of these things sound like they do some important stuff to my body. Maybe I should just keep them all in and then just find foods that I enjoy eating and that sit well with me. And then you're set, right? Then you have this big umbrella of all these foods you can choose from and you have this huge menu and then then you're never going to feel overwhelmed with any of the food talk you're like oh man you know i listened to this podcast that dr sal dino saldino yeah don saladino yeah don saladino it's funny that his last name has salad in it but but i've heard a lot of (laughs) but he's like oh he said that these vegetables are bad for me and I'm like, okay, well, have you ate these vegetables? Like, yeah, I eat them all the time. Do you ever feel bad? Well, if I eat broccoli, I feel a little bit bloated, but broccoli is supposed to be good for me, right? It's like, well, no, not if you feel bloated afterwards, take it out mm-hmm. find something else, right? It's like, there's just so many things you can do with it to understand that you need all the necessities of, you know, you need your, you need your fiber, you need your protein, you need your carbohydrates fat. You need everything. Don't take it out. Find what works for you and just have a good baseline. And like Paul said, if it feels very, very much overcomplicated, just go with protein. Just track your protein. Try to get one gram per pound in. Once you get that down, you're like, oh, I feel really good with this. Then track your calories. Those are the two most important things by far. If you can get those two down, I guarantee you, you can get to, for a guy, 12% body fat. For a girl, 20% body fat. And those are very, very healthy ranges, right? And that's just tracking those two things. Yeah, I mean, the biggest the biggest piece of advice I have for people who undertake any sort of body weight manipulation is if your goal is to maintain that body weight manipulation, whether it be muscle gain or weight loss or, or body fat loss, because realistically, as, as athletes, we're talking about body fat, not weight for the most part. If what you're doing isn't something you can foresee yourself doing forever, it's probably not going to be the modality that is, that gives you success forever. Right. I I have it in my initial email to clients. Like I would bet that you haven't found the diet that works for you because if you did, you'd still be following it. And so if you, if you think you could eat carnivore for the rest of your life and it makes you happy, fucking do it. I mean, you're going to be missing a couple build, a couple blocks in there that you might need to make up with some supplementation. But if you, if you feel good on carnivore, by all means, do it. If you enjoy eating keto and could give a shit about cheesecake, go ahead, eat keto. But for the vast majority of people, they want some sort of, some form of flexibility in a in a situation where if I want to have a piece of cheesecake at a wedding. I don't want to destroy the last, you know, four weeks of dieting that I've done and be sick or, you know, or whatever it might be. So creating a system or creating, like you said, a menu of of a vast menu of flexible foods that you could eat. I think that's just the best case scenario. Yeah. And I guess, I mean, the idea that, that you should have a diet that you can follow for the rest of your life. I don't even believe that, right? I am more of a fixture of like habits, right? If you can form these habits of making good choices, that's what you're going to do for the rest of your life. I don't know if anyone can follow a diet for the rest of their life, so to speak, right? 
Well, but, at that point, it doesn't, it's not a diet. It be, right. It exactly. Just be the way you eat. Exactly. That's the thing that you want to focus on with all this is like building good habits. Right. And I think that's going to be the most, you don't want to be so food focused that you, you can't really see the importance of like, I don't know the difference between a steak and a cheesecake. Right. It's like, okay, well, that's something we need to work on. Right. It's like building those habits are going to be very, very important. And then that's the, then you just adapt that lifestyle of healthier choices because you feel good. And that's something that you want to do too, as you're getting into your nutrition and you're diving into it is self-awareness of what you're eating, right? Enjoy the food that you're eating. It's one of those things where it's like, if you eat, you know, what, like, when people binge, they, they'll eat something like, oh, this is really good. And their brain tells them, well, let's just keep eating. And then they're eating to the point where you don't even taste the food anymore. You're just eating to eat, right? So I asking, haven't had a good one in a while. <laughs> <laughs> so asking yourself those type of questions of like, I mean, take a bite of something, man, this tastes really good. Do I need to take more of a bite or do I feel satiated? Do I feel satisfied? right? Having that inner dialogue is going to be very important. Like, oh man, I ate this meal. I've had gas for the last three hours. What what could be going on? Like having that inner dialogue is what's going to allow you to start building things out for yourself and and allow you to make better choices and better build better habits. Um, Because the idea of doing something for the rest of your life does seem very daunting, even if it is a flexible- You have to eat food for the rest of your life, man. Right. You're going to have to eat the food. So that's what I mean. If, if, if you create an environment where cheesecake's not off the menu, chips are not off the menu. These, these things are not off the menu. They're just things you choose a little less frequently. Yeah, exactly. Right. And that, that's, that's, that's what I was getting at with, you know, the right diet is the one you can follow for the rest of your life because the right diet is, is, as you said, the right diet is just really good habits um, some form of structure with a little bit of control around your protein intake. Yeah. And understanding um, that there's going to be dips and waves to it, right? No, nah, man. Shredded 24 <laughs> seven. Everyone falls into that boat. Even, even the great Will Smith, oh he got God. really fat on COVID. I saw that. And his the, wife um, left him for a young rapper. No. What? Didn't she cheat on him or something? I don't know. I don't follow. I don't follow pop culture stuff. So oh, you're missing out, Paul. I spend at least three hours a day following and keeping up. With so you train four times a day. <laughs> <laughs> you follow pop culture three hours a day. When do you sleep? That's if you say you sleep when you're dead, I will slap you through the screen. It's impossible. That's in, don't. If I, if I have a cliche, don't don't ruin it for me. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a roller coaster ride sometimes with nutrition. Um, but the smaller you can make those waves, the the better you're going to be all the time. Right. And that's what happens with a lot of people is they'll lose a bunch of weight and it's the first time they've ever done it Then they'll gain it back. Then they'll lose it. And then they'll gain a little bit more. Like you'll, you'll start to dial that in more and more. And the more you understand that, you know, human nature is going to kick in and you're not going to be perfect all the time. Um, but as long as you're building those, those habits, you're always going to be trending towards a healthier, more performance driven life. Then I think that's going to be more of the way you want to manifest your thought process around food and, and nutrition is like, am I going to eat this and, and feel good the next day? Or am I going to eat this and feel like shit? And if I feel like shit, then what am I going to accomplish tomorrow? And then, oh man, I'm not gonna be able to accomplish a lot. So maybe I'll just eat a little bit and not feel bad, right? And so it's just inner dialogue a lot of times too, self awareness. That's a hard shift to make, though, man. And like I, I say that from a from a very personal place. Like the idea that it's okay to, in my instance, like I think I, I think like I should weigh less. I, you know, if I'm gonna compete at 220, I should weigh less, or you know, whatever this last year has been the first year where I've really been like, I'm going to eat to perform as best I can. And wherever my body weight ends up, that's where it's going to be. And 
I, that doesn't mean that I've tracked any less consistently. That doesn't mean that I've been more flexible with, you know, fun foods or, or things like that. It just means that if I'm hungry, I eat. Yeah. You're shifting and your approach. How long did that take you? Probably a couple of years. To That's actually. what I mean. It's yeah. like we have all the knowledge in the world and we're still, we're, we're still humans, man. Right. We still struggle with it. It's about shifting your mindset and, you know, you'll figure it out slowly by slowly, but the idea is you're trying to figure it out too, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Cause I mean, it's a much happier place to look at, you know, I train because I love it and I want to perform as best I can. So that if I can do something outside the gym that helps me my time in the gym be more awesome, why wouldn't I do that? That's one of the reasons I don't drink alcohol is because I know it makes me feel like shit and I can't train as hard. Yeah. Like I also don't, I'm kind of a, kind of like a weirdo i don't really need social lubricant like <laughs> so if i'm in a group of people i don't have a problem engaging um oh so i never really i hate it yes yeah, i know I, the people i feel like you're the guy in the corner who sits awkwardly i don't sit awkwardly uh but i do have a very stern facial expression a resting bitch time. face if you say if you so to speak and i don't know what that means um but I do get told to to smile more often when I'm watching. I hate out. that. <laughs> like, so yeah, that's me. I'm very introverted. So if I am in a big group of people, it's like unless you're talking about something that is very interesting, and then I can isolate a conversation, probably not gonna talk to you. Have you been told that you're unapproachable, but you actually feel very approachable? Um, I've been told I'm unapproachable several times. And I know that I am. So I try to do a better job of being approachable. I'm the opposite, man. I think I'm so approachable. I think I like, I look like a guy you'd want to talk to. And then people are like, yo, man, you're so scary. I was so afraid to talk to you. Like, why? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, you know. The hand tattoo. The hand tattoo, really. I'm getting getting my neck tattooed in a couple weeks. God. What are you going to get on there, like? cocoa with a with lips on it or something uh no me and my brother are getting matching tattoos two it's, it's like two skulls talking to each other oh to indicate like i'm with stupid so when you guys are around people know like oh these are the two idiots that are together you get it yeah 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 if you don't need a t-shirt you're gonna get a tattooed on your neck yeah i still think that's a i'm on the record of saying this is a stupid idea you can get it done anywhere, right? You have a lot of coverage going. You like you have a lot of bare skin. I'm getting it on my neck, not on my throat. It's, it's going to be half covered by my t-shirt most of the time. You're going to be that old guy that's walking around with his collar popped because you have a stupid neck tattoo. Then you're going to look even dumber because your collar is popped and you're fucking old. The joke's going to be on you because I bet popped collars are going to come back in style. They were never in style. <laughs> First off. <laughs> So on the record, neck tattoo, two skulls talking to each other, stupid idea. Um, You're going to regret it and that's fine, but get it anyways. And I'll support you. YOLO, as the kids say. Exactly. So that this is kind of the general um, foundation block of, of nutrition for you guys. We hope that you enjoyed the conversation and got something out of it. Um, Biggest takeaways, like we've said before is, um, calories, protein are going to be the two biggest things to, to start off any nutrition plan. And then from there, try to fill in the rest with things that make you feel good, perform good, and that you enjoy eating and, um, and just try to build really, really good habits based around, um, food choices that you perform well on, and that doesn't irritate you. Um, and that doesn't affect your quality of life. And those things are going to be very important for you to just dial in. So if you guys have any questions, um, we have a lot of really good topics on nutrition coming up, a um, little bit of myth busting with some of this stuff with fasting and everything. And then also some very, very good guests coming on to talk about uh, functional nutrition, functional medicine, functional healing, that type of stuff. And then um, metabolism, like all that stuff. We have it covered. So hopefully we'll get everything that you guys are looking for, but we just want to start off with a very beginner approach, uh, to the nutrition topic. Anything you want to add before we get off, Paul? 
Uh, yeah, just to let people know that uh, we do still have a free trial over at Coaches Corner University. And if you were interested in the education summit that we had a couple weeks ago, you can purchase individual days for $49.99, or you can purchase the whole week for $149.99. Um, and those, uh, those are up on the website right now. Perfect. Yep. 14 day free trial, coachescorneru.com. Check it out and we'll catch you guys next week.